Hey everybody, welcome back to uh, Beginning C++. This week we're going to be talking about classes and objects, uh, the things we create from classes, and in general, object-oriented programming. Um, so before the 80s, uh, actually late 70s, if you happen to work at Xerox Park where this was created, um, most uh, programming was sort of procedural in nature. Uh, and then this group of people got together and they decided, you know, what if we took the idea of structs and we included some function pointers in there and some other stuff to kind of encapsulate um, all of these, you know, functionality and data into objects that we could then have interact with other types of objects. This sort of became a whole new paradigm of programming, right? It was a different way of solving problems. Um, that idea of encapsulating stuff into a neat package that you could then you sort of transfer and use over and over. Um, it sort of changed the way that we solve problems. And it really does come from structs. So when Bjorn Straustrub, uh, maybe saying that name wrong, um, decided to create C++, he took that idea of structs and sort of built on them to create something that was sort of easier to create um, object-oriented programming with. The thing they came up with is called classes, and it's basically what we're going to talk about this week. Um, they're basically objects that can hold more than just data. Um, they can hold data as well as other functionality all together into one thing. Um, so, uh, in fact, I should probably also mention while we're talking about this, in modern C++, uh, structs are implemented almost identically to classes. There's actually only one thing that separates the two of them. Um, so you can actually use structs as classes, but I will say that as somebody who um, you know, has been doing C++ for a while, when most programmers think of structs, they don't think of objects and functionality and everything. Usually structs are just a way of sort of encapsulating um, bits of data into chunks, the way that we talked about them last time. Um, as opposed to classes, which is where you're actually going to build out something that is a bit more um, big, robust, complicated. Um, if, you, if it's simple, it's just data, struct. If it's going to be big, complicated, involve functionality, classes. Um, but there's no real reason for that. In the language, they're almost identical. There's one difference, and when we get to it, I'll tell you what that difference is. So, uh, an example. If you were in a procedural language, right? Looking at, so what's the process by which I have to go through? You know, which is kind of how we've been solving problems so far in this class. And I was trying to keep track of baseball statistics, right? I would probably say, okay, so what happens in a baseball game? So somebody comes up to bat, right? So I have to sort of like create some variables and record an at bat. And I need to, you know, keep track of the strikes and every swing, really. I mean, baseball statistics are down to, did you strike out? you know, while looking or did you strike out while swinging, right? Th those Ks go in different directions depending on, you know, which the case is. So you're sort of keeping track of all this different stuff, but you're looking at the procedure first, the algorithm, if you will. With object-oriented programming, you're going to solve problems a little differently. And first, you're, you're going to say, how do I model the problem, right? What is a baseball player? What are the attributes of a baseball player that I need to keep track of? Um, you know, and then from there, from that model, then you go into the algorithm. But now you've got these objects that can interact with each other in a much more complicated way. Um, and so it changes the way you solve problems. You go data first rather than uh, algorithm first. Procedural programming, what's the process? Object-oriented programming, I need to model the data involved in this problem, and then I can try and figure it out. What is the relationship between um, you know, a baseball player and an at bat, you know, like, how do I, how do I record that? How, what's, you know, what's the system? Um, what's the you know, relationship between a patient, a doctor and a prescription, right? Those sorts of objects in my programming are now going to have attributes and functionality that can interact with each other in ways that'll seem a bit more intuitive as time goes on um, than just trying to keep track of variables everywhere and little things that's not encapsulated. We want to encapsulate stuff as much as possible. So to do that, we're going to create classes. Classes are like a blueprint for a, a class of objects that you're going to create in your program. Um, they are going to contain attributes about the object. Um, we're going to call those member variables in C++, um, although in other languages like Java, they'll call them fields. 
um, as well as a number of actions that you can actually do with the object. So like, I can tell this object to do something and it will call that, that member function. We're gonna call them member functions, but um, again, in other languages, they'll call them methods. Um, so fields, methods, member variables, member functions. It's just different languages, different, you know, verbiage or I guess nounage, whatever, um, different terms. And so this is what we're gonna to use to sort of encapsulate um, all of our data and functionality into objects. If you wanna think about it, um, when you're creating a class, this is where you're really creating the complexity, the usability of, of your objects in future, right? Um, so you going back to the baseball analogy, the class is baseball player. What are the attributes that I need to keep track of for a baseball player? Well, baseball players have names, baseball players have teams, they have positions, they have batting averages, they have ERAs. Not all of them have ERAs. Later on, we'll talk about subclasses, maybe we do something there, but like, you know, there should be a slot because pitchers exist and pitchers have ERAs. I'm saying this, I don't know how many people actually watch baseball anymore, but point being, um, it's baseball player, right? The object is Buster Posey. Buster Posey is an instance of the baseball player class, right? He's an actual player. He has a name. His first name is Buster. His last name is Posey. His team is the San Francisco Giants, and he is catcher, or he is a catcher, right? That's his position. He actually has values that you can put into those slots you created when you created the class. The class is where you decide the functionality and everything. So picture a class is like creating the blueprints for coffee makers. This is where you're designing the functionality. This is where your creativity needs to come in. When you actually are creating coffee makers, who cares? It's like your coffee maker, this person's coffee maker. And granted, in those cases, the coffee makers are all the same. But here, it's like, this is where I'm deciding how I'm going to design my class. And the reason for this is that, in general, you're gonna be part of a team, right? Um, and you're not gonna necessarily want everybody to have access to everything in your coffee maker because it's your job to create the coffee maker, right? You know how coffee should be brewed. You know, you know what speed the water should come across, you know, so how long the brew time is gonna be, what temperature the water should be. Like you are the expert in making coffee. You don't want somebody else who's writing code to come in and kind of mess with your settings. And so you may create something that's very simple, right? There are some coffee makers that are just one switch. Um, other coffee makers are very fancy. They give you lots of different ways to interact with, um, you know, with your coffee. And sometimes you want to create sort of an easy interface for other programmers to use your objects, right? Um, so an example that I often do with coffee makers is, you know, in general, you can't change the temperature of the water on most coffee makers, right? Maybe a very fancy one, but not your standard coffee makers. But that's actually not true. If you look on a lot of coffee makers, there's a button that says one to four cups, right? And whenever you make a small pot of coffee, you, know, you push that button. Now, why do you push the button? What does the button do? What does it matter, right? What matters is that when you have lots of coffee grounds, the water takes longer to go through the coffee grounds. Um, and so you set your temperature of water and the pace of the water to be at a certain thing so that you get nice coffee. But when you have very little coffee grounds, there's just not much Resistance, it goes through so fast, um, and that can under extract the beans. So when you push the button, it raises the temperature of the water so that you extract more from the beans. If you're to do that with a full pot, with you know a thick, I guess, puck of you know coffee grounds, uh, it would probably over extract and it would be bitter. If you like bitter coffee, you should always push that button. Um, but otherwise, you know trust that the person who made the machine knows how to make coffee and don't touch anything unless you're making a small pot. But the idea is that they didn't tell you that that button raises the temperature of the water because why would you have, why would you care? Like you, you're not the expert in making coffee. They are, right? So they gave you a button that's just saying, when you make a small pot, push this button. You don't need to know why. I've given you a simple interface for something that's actually much more complex on the inside um, and We'll talk more about that as a design idea later, but yeah, it's there. Then obviously, when you actually make a coffee maker, that is an object, right? That is your coffee maker. It is an instance of that particular class of coffee makers, right? Anyway, um, here's a weird example that probably won't make any sense to anybody anymore because this game is getting less and less popular over time, but it's probably the first instance of the word instance being used in pop culture. 
Uh, World of Warcraft was a very popular game for a very long time. I'm sure you've heard of it, even if you've never played it. And the dungeons in that game were called instances. Why? It's because it was what kind of made World of Warcraft special. Previous to that in MMOs, you had these you know, sort of massive areas where people would come in and there'd be some big creature. And it's like, ooh, the big creature spawned. Let's all go kill the big creature. And it's just a mass riot of people attacking stuff. Um, you didn't get the, the nuance, the subtlety, the strategy, um, because it was just mobs, right? Like just groups of people attacking dragons. So what they did was they say, hey, you know, if you walk through this little shimmery portal, you're going to get an instance of this dungeon for just you and your four other friends. Or if it's a raid, you and your 39 other friends, right? The idea is that it's because now you have limited numbers, we can design the fights in such a way that they take strategy, right? That's completely different. That didn't happen before. Um, and you also didn't have to worry about a bunch of other weirdos. It was you and your four friends. Like, that was fun. You know, it was, you, you had to kind of work together. Somebody had to heal somebody, you know? It's like, it became something that was a little bit more complex. Um, but they called those dungeons instances because, you know, how many molten cores are there in the World of Warcraft? You're probably thinking, one, if you've ever played the game. If you haven't played the game, you're thinking, what's a molten core? But anyway, it's a big dungeon type thing. Uh, where that big flame guy lives. And you think that there's one, but there isn't, right? Every week, you and your, you know, guild got a fresh instance of the Molten Core dungeon, or raid in this case. And there would be lots of different Molten Cores happening all at the same time for everybody else and all of their friends, right? Like everybody got their own Molten Core. Everybody got an instance of the Molten Core class which was probably a subclass of a much larger thing, but we're not talking about subclasses this week. That will be for another week. Regardless, um, yeah, instances. You get your own version of something. So uh, let's say that we're going to design a class, right? And in this case, I'm going to talk about carts um, from Mario. And I understand that we're starting in a very vague way, and eventually we're going to get to real code. But kind of understanding the concepts maybe going in can be helpful. Um, so. Uh, talk about member variables, what type of uh, member variables and member functions might be, might belong to something of type cart in Mario Kart. Uh, and really, again, this is when you're designing the class. When you're designing the class, you're designing the functionality. And in terms of video games, when you're talking about functionality, you're talking about gameplay. So, what are the attributes that we would want to give carts? Well, the first one is mass. Right? If you've ever played Mario Kart, and this one I can pretty much guarantee most of you have played, everybody has played Mario Kart, that's just the rite of passage in life. Um, but mass, right? Some cars are very small. I, I'm going to kind of combine cart and driver, right? So like, you know, Toad with his little car and Bowser with his big car. You know, when the two collide on the road, you know, one is going to go flying off the road, the other is not going to be affected much. Um, this affects gameplay. Right? If you are Bowser, and Bowser is my second favorite character to play, you should be a jerk. You should be bouncing into everybody, knocking everybody off the road. That's why you chose Bowser. He has a lot of mass. Donkey Kong would be the same. Um, it changes the way you play the game. And this is not a game design class, but you know, when it comes to game mechanics, the things that make them special, meaningful decisions by players. If you play Bowser, there should be a reason other than the fact you like the color green, right? You're playing it because you like to knock people off the road. Um, top speed. What's the highest speed you can possibly get up to? Not, not how fast you can get there. That's a different one. But what's your top speed, the faster you can get there? Actually, um, Bowser has a fairly high top speed. It takes him forever to get there, but he's got a fairly high top speed, as does my favorite character to play, which is Luigi. Um, and so... You know, high top speed is a different type of gameplay, right? What are you trying to do with high top speed? The same thing I do every time I play Mario Kart. Like, start from the front, get out in front, put as much distance between me and everybody else as I possibly can. I mean, like, you start playing Mario Kart the first, like, lap as though it were an actual racing sim. Like, you're hitting apexes. You want to put as much distance as you can from all of those shells and everything else flying around. Um, and that's why they created the blue shell, by the way, uh, which I get hit with a lot. Um, but point being, 
top speed, your goal is put distance between you and the pack and just go as far as you can. Do not get hit. Um, shells ruin your game. Acceleration rate is the opposite. Acceleration rate is how fast you get up to your top speed. This is where Toad you know, becomes great. Um, because when you have high acceleration rate, that allows you to recover quickly after uh, getting hit with a shell. Right? Again, a meaningful decision. If you know that it's going to be a knockout battle, or if you're playing in battle mode rather than a race, you probably want high acceleration, not high top speed. Top speed doesn't do a whole lot when you're trying to run around in circles and hit people with stuff. Being able to recover quickly is much more important. If you like battles, you probably want high acceleration, not high top speed. Boost multiplier, this is Mario's land, right? This is you know, every time you do a little jump, you get a little boost. Every time you get sparks, you get a little boost. How much of a boost do you get? Mario gets better boosts than any other character. So if you're somebody who does a lot of tricks and you're willing to kind of do that on every corner, you want to be Mario. Off-road penalty. When you go off-road, how much does your car slow down? Right? This is another attribute of cards that we want to somehow encapsulate into our objects. Um, Donkey Kong, with his, you know, little dune buggy thing he barely slows down at all uh you know me on the ouija on the little speeder bike yeah i come to an almost halt i can never leave the road donkey kong not so much if you like that then it forms your gameplay it's a meaningful decision if you play as donkey kong a if you're a young player like you have kids um or like cousins or something and they're young and they don't really know how to play very well, they should probably play as Donkey Kong. It's going to be, like when they go off-road, it's not going to hurt them as much. Uh, but if you want to play as Donkey Kong, that means that you need to know your maps, right? Because there's always, what's that little jump doing in the middle of the grass? Oh, that's for Donkey Kong, right? Um, especially if you have like a mushroom, you can get out across the grass, hit that ramp, and probably, do. you should know where all the shortcuts are if you're Donkey Kong, because you don't get that same penalty that everybody else does. Anyway, member functions are easy because in video games, they're usually tied to button presses. We need a button to go faster. We need a button to break, which is actually apparently true in the new version if you play at like the highest CC level, but uh, whatever. I've never hit a break in a Mario game in my life, so whatever. Um, you gotta turn left, you gotta turn right because it's not NASCAR, um, and you know, you gotta use item. I have to be able to throw shells, activate my mushroom, whatever, right? Member functions are objects or actions that I can take on my object, right? I want my cart to accelerate, not anybody else's. I want to launch my shell right now, um, not somebody else's. So those, those actions need to take place on my object, my cart, not yours. With that, we can create a class diagram. And so this is simple UML. Um, ignore the pluses and minuses. I'll explain that in a second. But for right now, we've got you know, basically the names of our attributes along with the types that we would use to represent them. Um, and then the uh, functions. Now, by the way, yeah, you, you can actually have, well, we'll talk about the pluses and minuses later. The tops are all the attributes, the bottoms are all the actions. You can have these different functions. All these functions happen to have no, like, inputs. Like, there's no um, uh, parameter lists. Uh, but that's just because of the, the you know, the nature of the functions, and then they're all, they all return void. But where that re void is would be the return. And if you had parameters, you would put those types in the parentheses, like you would normally would for any other, you know, um, parameter list. This gets us to an idea of data hiding. And it's actually why all of the, all of the attributes have a minus next to them. When you design your class, you can decide if you want these members to be public or private. So private members can only be accessed by functions that are part of this class. You have to be a member of the class in order to access private data members. Um, it could be public, um, and public would mean that everybody gets access to that data member. So you can go in and change that variable directly or access that function uh, directly. If it's a private function, nobody else can call that function unless they're a member of your class. Um, by the way, there are other things besides private and public, but we'll talk about those other weeks because they have to do with concepts we don't know yet. But right now, public and private is enough. 
you give nobody else access or you give everybody else access. Um, and so then because you can sort of make your members either public or private, that gives you some control over what people can do with your objects. It allows you to um, have, yeah, have more control. In general, you, you don't want to give up more control than you should because, you know, again, like you, you were given a task, you are, I should say your team, right, was given a task to create this class. Um, and other people may not know the complexity that's happening underneath. So you want to give those other programmers an, an easy to use interface to be able to use your objects without really screwing them up. Um, yeah, and so we implement this idea of data hiding, which is that because I have the ability to make things private, uh, and by the way, looking at the UML list here, you can see the access controls for each of those members. If it's a minus in front of it, that's a private member. If it's got a plus, that's a public member. Now you notice that all of the attributes are private and all of the functions are public. All the functions are public because somebody has to call them. Uh, and all the attributes are private because we're implementing data hiding. But, you know, it doesn't always have to be that way. You can have public attributes, public member variables, or you can have private functions. Um, functions that only would make sense for another function in your cart class to call. Uh, Hashtag is protected, but we're not talking about that yet. Another week. Um, so here's the idea of data hiding. Variables in a class are usually private, right? Um, and in fact, for classes, members are private by default. If you don't specify that if a member is public or private, it's private. And that's actually the difference between classes and structs. Structs, the one difference between the two, the way they're implemented in modern C++, is structs are members are public by default and in classes members are private by default but it doesn't really matter to me because i always explicitly state what i want um, i'm one of those type of programmers you can decide what you want to be when you grow up so when you grow up sorry if it sounds condescending you know what i mean like you get to decide what you want to do in your career or actually your employer does i guess um, but then because all, all of my members are private, my data members are private, my member variables, I should say, um, and I might make a couple public, right? Like there's, there's, a, there's a reason for that where you would want to make a member a variable public. But you know, we'll hit those on a case by case basis. In general, making my variables private, and then I'm going to create functions that allow people to access those private members, right? What that does is if I give you direct access to a variable, you can do anything you want to that variable. You could set that variable to a negative number, even though that makes no sense in reality. You could reset it for some reason. You could do anything. There's no checks, there's no balances. You have access to that memory location, that variable. Um, if I give you a function, then I can check to say, hey, does that value actually make sense? Right? Like maybe you're trying to access you know, something, and it's like, but you can't be a negative number. You can't, you can't order negative pairs of boots. That's not allowed. Um, and so I can use my functions to make sure that my internal logic sort of stays. Um, and so we have two types for these um, in general, and these are not exactly the same, but we call them getters and setters. Getters will get the value of a variable. They just like say, oh, you want to know, like, you know, uh, what the balance of this checking account is right now? Here you go. Here's here's the here's the balance. Um, setters will set the balance, right? They'll say, oh, I want to actually change the balance to this. Um, those are very sort of specific things that are kind of common. Um, creating getters and setters. Your, your book will use the terms accessors and mutators. So accessors will give you access to the value. Like, hey, I will, I will return the value for you. I'm not going to allow you to change it, but I'll let you see what it is. Um, mutators will actually allow you to change the value. And it may be changed in a way other than just setting it to a direct number. It may be say, oh, could you make it go up some? Could you make it go down some? Whatever. Um, but it just allows you to change that, that number for the private data member. The accessors and mutators have to be public for so other people can use them. But again, because they're functions, I get to write lines of code. I get to do checks. I get to say no, right? I don't get that if I give you direct access to the variable. You can do whatever you want with that. So uh, why do we do it? We do it for all the reasons I just said. 
uh, it really does help enforce sort of the integrity of your object's internal data. It helps implement your, your business logic or whatever kind of logic it is you're, you're trying to implement because nobody can sort of mess with the raw numbers. They have to go through your methods in order to make changes. Um, that makes sense. So think about a bank account class. This is probably where it would make you know, a really easy analogy. All accounts have a balance, right? How much money is in the account? But I don't want to give people access to the balance directly, right? If I did that, the person writing the ATM code might say, you know, and the person writing the ATM code is a brilliant person, probably knows so much about hardware and all sorts of neat and wonderful things that I don't know, right? But I'm the person creating the account class. What I, do, what I know is accounting. I know that you cannot change the balance of an account without an offsetting you know, transaction. If I'm going to debit the balance of an account, there should be an offsetting credit to another account. If there's going to be a credit to this account, there has to be an offsetting debit to another account. This is the way accounting works, right? Well, the person writing the ATM code, who's probably a wonderful person, you know, Sally, three cubicles down, working on a different team, doesn't understand that because her job isn't to understand accounting. Her job is to understand hardware and a bunch of security stuff that I probably don't know. But if I create my objects with an easy to use interface so that Sally can use my account class in her code and not have to worry about all of this, then that's great, right? Um, so what I would do is I would keep balance, the member variable, private. And then I would give access to the balance through things like functions like check balance, right? Which would probably just tell you what the balance is or withdrawal, which would take money from the thing, but would put it to a different account, right? That is going to go to a different account or it's going to, you know, be paid out in cash. Uh, deposit, right? You know, oh yeah, money's coming into the account, but it's also coming from somewhere and there has to be a check there, right? Um, so balance in this case would be a private member variable. Check balance is a public accessor function. Right? It just gives you, says, oh, you want to know how much money is in the account? I could actually maybe run a check, make sure that this is you authorized to get this information, and then I can give you the balance. Um, deposit and withdrawal. Deposit and withdrawal, they're just mutator functions. One raises the amount of money in a, an account, one takes away money in an account. Um, but I can also make sure that there's an offsetting transaction to another account. And I can also handle stuff that nobody would think about. You know, If you deposit... Um, more than $10,000 in cash to an account, there's a report that has to be sent to the FBI, right? You wouldn't know that. Why would you know that? It's, try, it's you know, people trying to track for potential money laundering. But like, the ATM person doesn't need to know that, right? The accounting person needs to know that. So everybody sort of works in their own areas and creates interfaces so that your objects can play nicely together. And it's easy to understand, and when stuff needs to be done, it gets done, right? The ATM person doesn't need to worry about accounting. They should just worry about, oh, somebody gave me you know, a check for $200 into this machine. I need to deposit that into an account, right? Bam, bam, bam. Oh, here's the account number where the check was drawn. Here's the, the account that we're depositing the money into. Two, $200 is the amount, whatever that function looks like, whatever it takes, and then bam, you know, everything should work according to plan. So, um, as I talk a lot about design, we haven't talked about code at all, but again, what you do as a computer programmer is 80% what you do on the whiteboard and 20% what you do on the keyboard. Um, it's good to think about design and the idea of abstraction, right? When I'm creating a user interface, I'm creating something that is hopefully a simple abstraction for other people to use that hides a lot of complexity in the background, stuff that people don't need to know. Um, and so, like, well, my best example for abstraction in sort of object-oriented design is um, how do you steer a car? Right? If I ask you that question, how do you steer a car, your answer is probably going to be, well, you turn the wheel left, you turn the wheel right. And that's great. You have been presented with a simple abstraction. And you believe it because your relationship to a car is as a driver, right? Now, if I were to ask a mechanical engineer, how do you steer a car? They would say, well, you pivot the front wheels. 
We pivot the front wheels because that creates greater friction in the forward vector, but less friction in this vector, which changes the attitude. Attitude. Oh, I'm not. I'm not an actual mechanical engineer. I. Yaw. No. Yaw. Regardless, it's going to cause the front the front to go to the side, right? Which is going to create an arc, right, in your car's path. So you're going to, you know make an arc. Now that, by the way, is going to cause the outside wheel to have to spin faster than the inside wheel because it's traveling a greater distance. That means there's going to be a lot of slippage and a lot of squealing of tires, or you're going to have to connect the two axles to something called a differential. The differential will allow the outside wheel to spin faster without it squealing and you know doing whatever it's going to do. Um, because the car is now manufactured after whenever we decided to make this mandatory, uh, as we're going through this turn, I'm also gonna have to have a system, which is actually gonna have to be set up for even non-turn situations, but a system that's going to detect wheel slippage. And if there is ever wheel slippage, it's going to apply braking pressure to the wheel that's slipping. That's called uh, anti, or not anti-lock brakes, that's called traction control. Hi, I'm not a mechanical engineer, but that's traction control, right? There's a lot of complexity going on in steering your car, right? You probably didn't even know what a differential was, but you were presented with a simple abstraction, a wheel. You can turn it left, you can turn it right, and you know, let's not even get into Ferraris that are gonna apply a greater pressure to combat the yaw uh, when you're turning and cornering, and you know, everybody else who you know decides to actually push power through those differentials to actually give more power to the outside wheel, that's your, well, anyway, point being, Steering a car is really complex. It's very, very simple for you because there's good engineering out there and a great abstraction. Um, incidentally, the initial uh, first cars, a lot of them had leather straps to steer the car because that's how you steered a horse. And uh, needless to say, on cars, that's a terrible way to steer stuff. It's all floppy. and You want something that's a little bit more precise. Good. At, the wheel is a better abstraction than leather straps. All right, so let's actually look at code. We're going to create a very simple class, a rectangle class. Um, this class is going to have some basic attributes and some things we can do with it, some functionality. So the syntax to create a class is just it's very similar to the struct, right? Except that we're actually going to use our private and public labels in here. So class and then whatever you want your class name to be. Uh, and then you're going to create a block of code. The block of code is going to end with a semicolon, just like it did with structs. And inside, we're going to use these labels. At this point, we only have two, private and public. So private colon and public colon. And then everything underneath there should be indented one more level. And this is where we're going to list all your members. It could be variables, it could be functions, whatever. But if you want it to be private, put it under the private label. If you want it to be public, put it under the public label. And yes, because things are defaultly private, you don't have to put private colon. You can just start listing members and they will all be private. I don't like that. I like to explicitly state so that it's very easy to see what's private and what's public. But again, strictly speaking, not necessary. <clears throat> so here we go. We have our class rectangle with our private and our public labels. Um, notice that the rectangle class starts with a capital. And that's so that we can tell the difference between what's a class and what's an instance of a class or a variable. Instances and variables start with lowercase. Classes start with uppercase. We'll call it capitalized camel case. I think it's actually called Pascal case in the industry, but I would just call it capitalized camel case. It's camel case, but with the big the uppercase letter at the beginning. So here we go. I've listed now all of my different things. And by the way, if you're writing this in sort of just one big file. This would go before main, kind of where we would put in our structs. Um, and so this would be class rectangle. It's got two private uh, members. The things you use to re represent a rectangle are the length and the width. Um, public members, we're gonna have get length, set length, get width, and set width. Uh, these are our getters and setters for those two private members. If we don't put those in, there's no way to change the size of this rectangle. Every rectangle will be, actually every rectangle will be a really random number by a really random number because we don't have the ability to default to zero yet. We'll talk about that next week um, when we talk about constructors and stuff. But for right now, the only way we can actually change the length and width of a rectangle is with a setter. The only way we can actually get to that value to actually calculate stuff 
is with a getter. So we need to have getters and setters for both. Um, and this, by the way, is sort of the industry default naming scheme that you would use for getters and setters. The variable is called length. Get length is the getter. Set length is the setter. You'll notice that get length returns a double because length is a double. So it's just returning the value and it doesn't need anything to do that job because it get length actually has access to that variable inside of this object, right? Every rectangle is going to have a different length. And so you'll have the ability to get the length of your particular rectangle by calling this function on an object of type rectangle on an instance of the rectangle class. That makes sense. Um, set length doesn't return anything. doesn't need to. What it does need to do is um, take something. So you have to send a double to set length, and that will hopefully change the length to the double that you want. Um, same thing for width. It's just a different variable. So um, here's an interesting question. Can I make something read only? Well, yeah, of course. If you want to make a variable read only, give, create the getter, which allows people to read, but don't give it the setter. And I suppose the same would be true for the opposite. If you wanted to make it write only, you'd create the setter and not create a getter. But I've never made something write only in my life. I'm sure there's a reason for it, but I can't think of one. Usually it's either read write or read only. Now I'm going to add another method. This is not a getter or a setter. This is just a new method called area. It's just going to return the area of our rectangle. Notice though that it does not need any parameters. Why? Because when you call area on an object, that area is going to have access to that object's length and width, the variables that are stored inside of that object. <clears throat> so uh, how do you actually implement these? So this would be after main. Right, so from main on down, uh, we're going to, you know, implement all of our functions. And again, I'm kind of laying it out on one file, but this week we're going to start splitting our files into multiple files, which is going to be a bit confusing. If you have a problem on um, an assignment where it's like I can't get the files to work and you need to just stick it all into one file, that's fine. Submit it that way, and over time it'll get easier. Um, but for right now. So, um, so to implement something, because this implementation is not actually in the class itself, right? We declared the class. Now we're going to implement the functions in those classes. Uh, we need to say that, hey, this area is not a new area function. I'm implementing the area function that belongs to rectangle. That's a member of the rectangle class. So I'm going to use the scope operator, which is the colon colon. So this area returns a double, the area of the rectangle. It's a member of the rectangle class, so it's rectangle colon colon area. And then, just like any other function, open curly brace, close curly brace, and inside I have to actually implement it. How do you calculate the area of a rectangle? It's the length times the width. And I can just say length times width. Done. <clears throat> because when you actually call area, you're going to be calling area on a specific, um, a specific like instance of a rectangle. So when I say length, it's going to be the length of that particular rectangle that you're calling it on. The width would be the width of that particular rectangle you're calling it on. <clears throat> Here is the getter and setter. Uh, this is going to be the same every single time with getters and setters. And in fact, next week I'll probably tell you how to make it much faster using C line. There's a reason I chose C line because um, you can auto generate this stuff. But because it is so simple. <clears throat> but again, get length just returns the length. Set length can uh, set the length. Now, by the way, this is the simplest version of it. So set length takes a double and just says, I want length to equal whatever that variable was, L. Get length just returns the length, right? So one just returns the value, the other one changes the value to whatever you sent. But I could also put an if statement in there, right? If length less than zero, then just return. Don't do anything. Because I can't have a negative, you know, a negative number on a rectangle. I can just refuse to do it. I can choose to do whatever I want to do. I have the ability to make these more complex to protect my objects so that they make sense in the end. Um, and that's why we're doing getters and setters. Then when I actually want to create an object, 
Done. I just say rectangle living room. Awesome. Now I have an instance of the rectangle type called living room. Um, I can then actually create some dimensions to this rectangle. I could say living room dot. And so we're going to call this function on that instance of a rectangle. I can't call it on a rectangle <coughs> any more than I can, you know, fail, you know, the class student. I can't fail the class student. I can't, or I, why am I saying fail? That seems super negative. I can't give an A to class student. I have to give an A to an actual student. I have to pass a student, right? Like a specific one, like, you know, like, Jenny, Jenny passes, you know, so Jenny dot pass with grade A or whatever, you know, like whatever that function is, I have to call it on an individual student. To set the length and width of this rectangle, I have to do it on a real rectangle, not on the idea of rectangles. It has to be on the living room. So living room dot set length, 18 feet, living room, I, the, the units aren't listed here, but living room dot set width, 14.5, double amount of carpet equals living room dot area. And that dot area, which is just length times width, is going to know, oh, but it's the length and width that belong to the living room object, right? That living room instance of the rectangle class, which now has values. <clears throat> so that's how I'm actually using objects, using dot notation, just like we did with structs. That's why we did structs in the beginning, because it kind of helps to, it's a very simple way of thinking about what objects are going to allow us to do later. Now here, I've messed something up. I'll allow you to pause the video to think about uh, what I did wrong. And if you're back with me, uh, yeah, the thing I can't do here is I'm inside of main. Main is not a member of the rectangle class. So kitchen.length equals 12. I'm trying to directly change the variable length inside that kitchen object. That's private. I don't have access. Right, and so I'm gonna get a compile time error. I'm not allowed to do this. If I wanna change the length of a kitchen, I can't just set the value directly, I have to use the set length function um, because maybe that set length function is gonna prevent me from putting in negative numbers, right? Um, so I, as the person who's writing main, have to you know, respect whoever, you know, you know, Jose three cubicles down, whatever he wrote for his you know, rectangle class, like, hey, I can't, I can't access that stuff directly. There may be reasons that I don't know, right? Maybe there's other properties of rectangles I don't realize. Um, so I'm going to use his interface to make sure that I am, you know, actually doing what needs to be done. So <clears throat> uh, instance variables and functions, every single instance has its own set of variables. And so when you call a function on an instance, right, it's going to have access to those individual things. If I were to call area of a kitchen, I'm gonna get 140 square feet. Uh, if I call uh, you know, area on the bedroom, I get whatever the heck that is, 15 times 12, uh, you know, something. I'm not gonna do the math in my head right now. But the idea is that I'm gonna get different answers for all of them. If I do, uh, what's the get length on den? It's gonna be 20, right? Because every single object has a different set of values inside of it. Um, and that's the idea, right? If I want to figure out what Buster Posey's, you know, batting average is, I want to say Buster Posey dot get batting average and get his batting average, right? Nobody else's. I, I'm calling on a specific object and every baseball player will have a different batting average. Now we're going to get to the point of splitting the files. So if you've been doing it the way that I've sort of asked you to do, right? Where you start out with maybe some like header stuff, some includes, um, and then you go to sort of all your different, you know, I'm gonna declare all my different function prototypes um, for things that don't belong to classes. Then I'm gonna create either my structs or my classes, all that stuff where I'm declaring things. And then there's sort of like a break, right? Picture just a break there after all those, all those de declarations. Then you do main, right? Right now, main is probably actually going to belong to a different you know, file altogether, uh, what we call a client file. It's going to use your class. But then underneath main are all the different files where you're actually implementing the functions for your class. Those are going to go into a separate file as well. And so uh, we have you know, header files. Header files just, just have the declarations, right? Um, Chernow actually has a really great video that I'm, I have as a 
resource thing can kind of help you balance stuff out. Uh, but these are the, the sort of simple like header files just have declarations. Uh, they may have includes as part of it, right? So you may have to include some stuff in order to, because you may, even you may be declaring things of types that belong to other classes. So you need to include those header files, those classes header files into yours. But the idea is that when you include, when you want to include a type of class into your, into your code, you only include the header file. You just need the declarations. You don't need the implementations. That stuff can happen later. Um, and that sort of helps speed things up. It makes it a little bit more efficient. Plus, you can just look at a header file and be able to see what that class can do um, and how it sort of works without actually having to look at the implementation file and all the code that actually gets called when you want to deposit something into an account. All I need to know is when I want to call the deposit function, what do I need to send? Well, I need to send the other account that it's, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to pull the money from, uh, how much, and, you know, maybe a couple other bits of, you know, par parameters I need to send. I just need to know how to use your, your classes, and I can do that just through the header files. So uh, what you're seeing here in green are called, um, they're sort of like, a, a, bleh, I forgot what they're called, uh, but they're guardians. They're, they sort of protect uh, from you accidentally including something twice. And this can happen a lot when you have like one class that includes, you know, class A and class B, uh, but then another class over here is going to include your class as well as class A. And so it's like, well, but class A was included in this class, so now I'm going to include it twice, and that's going to cause a whole bunch of redundancy and um, conflicts. So what we do is we put these include guards um, in the over our header files, and we only need it over the header files because these are the ones that we're including. And these are preprocessor commands that say, if not defined something, in this case, circle.h, but we do underscores in all caps, then define circle.h. That's all your code is in there, your grays, all this code. And then at the bottom, end if. Um, so those include guards will protect uh, you from doing that. This is the C++ way of doing it. Most uh, IDEs will actually allow you to do um, something called pragma once, which is just at the very top you do hashtag pragma once and then it's done. Um, but honestly, if you create your classes using um, the the PyCharm, you know, create new class feature, which I'll hopefully show you how to do in a different video, um, then the, you don't have to worry about it. This will be done for you. Um, then the implementation file, the thing you need to know there is you have to include the header file because if you don't have the header file, you don't have all the declarations for all the things you're trying to implement. So here, um, you want to include circle.h or rectangle.h or whatever it is you're doing. Um, and then after that, you just start implementing those things, making sure to put in the, um, the actual you know, area or the, the class that it belongs to. By the way, I'm going to correct this right now on the video, that returns a double. I don't want anybody to be confused. <clears throat> returns a double, it's from the circle class, it's called area, and then inside you implement stuff, right? So there you go. Um, implementation files, just where you put all the implementations for your functions. A client file is technically any file that's going to use your class. It could be actually another class, right? You could have a header file that is technically also a client file for a different class. Um, but client files, usually CPP files, they're actually just going to use it. So this is where I would put main, right? So your, your project will now have three files, a header file for your class, an implementation file for your class, and then just sort of a client file for like main, like main.cpp, where you actually use this class in your code. The idea is that then these two files, the header and implementation files, you can throw them into other projects, right? Um, you know, and use them as you will. So it's a way of sort of separating stuff out that makes it a bit easier. And it's sort of the traditional way it's done in C++. Um, but anyway, we'll talk more uh, hopefully this week about how to actually implement stuff and hopefully do a demo in PyCharm. Uh, but there are some resource videos that will also sort of help you be able to create the classes. Um, for your assignment this week. So if you have any questions, send me a message uh, in Canvas, and otherwise I will see you online.